Yes. So let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you have set us free. You tell us that when we are apart from you and we are left in our own sinful self, we are prisoners. We are slaves of sin. But Jesus, you came to set us free. You paid the penalty. You died to ransom us so that we would be able to be set free. And as the song talked about, your love being poured out on us. Your word says that same thing, that by your Holy Spirit, your love has been poured into our hearts. And Lord, we need that. We need that. I pray that for each person that's here today and that's listening today, that your love would be poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one who pours that into us. We want to be open to you. You're, the word says that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit. So let us not get in the way of what you want to do. As Galatians 5 talks about, there's the fruit of the Spirit or there's the acts of the sinful nature. And Lord, we battle with those in our lives we need you, Holy Spirit, to live through us so that we can have victory over those areas. And we, we confess those to you, Lord, those sins that so easily entangle us, those besetting sins that just hinder our walk with you and hurt our testimony and hurt your name. We pray for your forgiveness, O oh Lord, and we bring those to you that you would forgive us, like 1 John 1, 9 says, to believers that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, we, we need you, and we ask that you would free us from those things, that we can sing that, to sing the song of the redeemed, that we truly are free. Let us live lives that are worthy, that, that line up with that kind of freedom, oh, God, that we would no longer walk in bondage to sin, Lord, do you say that, you, uh, that it is for freedom that we have been set free? We need to walk in that, oh Lord. We thank you. We pray that you would just activate our minds and our hearts today as we look into your word that you would teach us. Um, Holy Spirit, Jesus said that you are the teacher that will guide us into all truth. We pray that you would do that, oh Lord, and that my words would not get in the way of the great things that you want to communicate to your people this morning. And we praise you, Lord. We thank you for, for Scott and Laura, for the faith that they have, that the, this is a passion for them, Father, that, um, that they're willing to go. And uh, Lord, forgive us for being just intimidated to even talk to people who are right in front of us. Lord, we just, we just pray that you would touch our hearts, oh God. And that you would give us that motivation, that love for you that just overflows here, wherever we live, in our circles of influence, whether it's our family, that's our school, our neighborhood, our workplace, whatever that is, that our love for you would just, and your love in our hearts would flow out to that. But give us a passion, too, for the rest of the world that needs to know and the, the suffering that goes. We pray for the good news to be sped along the way as Scott and Laura and Rainey and Vincent are willing to give their lives to do. Help them, Lord, help us. Guide us now this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're in our study. I encourage you to take your Bible in, in front of you, or if you brought one with you, to Exodus. And... We're actually like in the the 10th sermon here. And we're going to begin like at the end of chapter 5. And I'm realizing that we're going to get back to uh, chapter, the end of chapter 5 to kind of give us a context. Because this is kind of a long story, which reminds us that living a life to follow Jesus is kind of a long story. It's a long journey. It's not just something that you do one day and it's done. 
I was with, uh, I was playing basketball with a, a 16 year old kid the other day. And he, and he said he couldn't believe how fast the years went that suddenly he's 16 years old. That's interesting, right? And I'm a few years older than that. And uh, I don't know if you can relate with that. Does, does, has life seemed to like go fast? Even if you're like 16 or, or if you're 20 or if you're nine or if you're 50 or older, doesn't it seem like just yesterday that time goes so fast? But God has called us to a journey. And that's why the little slide up there says a journey to freedom. Moses was walking with God. Moses was going to be used by God, but it took, it took him a long time for God to talk him into it because he didn't really want to. He, was, he had a lot of things that were battling inside him. He was intimidated. He, was, he felt like, uh, I was hearing some, he was hearing something. Moses was intimidated. He felt inadequate, and he tried to give all kinds of excuses to God. And so it took God a while for him to get Moses on board. And we're, we're about to see, we're almost there where Moses is finally on board. And he says, okay, God. And he's 80 years old. And that's just a, that's an encouragement, right? That no matter what age we are, that God wants to use us, God wants to walk through us whatever journey we're in, and it's not wasted. Whatever you're going through now, it's not wasted. You think of all the time that Moses spent. He had 40 years in Egypt where he had a privileged life, and then he had to run for his life. And for 40 years, he was like a nobody out herding sheep. It was, it was like totally being forgotten. And yet God was preparing him for something. So even if you feel like you are, you're not in the action yet, you're not really excited, you're not seeing that God is using you, realize that God is preparing you. He hasn't forgotten you, and he doesn't waste anything. So even as Scott shared, sometimes sickness, um, we don't like sickness. We pray that it ends quickly, and that's okay. I pray for that too, but I appreciate Scott and Laura's attitude that, you know, sometimes God uses these times to work in us, to reveal things in us that need to change, or just our ability to trust, just our ability to trust God. And that is like a daily battle with me, a daily learning lesson that, um, God is wanting me just to trust him. It's interesting, even this morning, we had a whole bunch of different technical difficulties. That's why you know, we had to switch computers. The camera wasn't working. All kinds of stuff going on. And so, you know, I'm getting a little stressed out, just praying and uh Working with Christy, Christy kept her calm today and was operating in faith and encouraging me. And that, uh, okay, we trust that God, you're going to work this out. We need your help. We're praying. But I'm just going to have to relax and believe that you got this. Moses was learning that. And uh, when, as we jump into chapter 5 of Exodus here, it's like Moses was doing God's work. Moses came back. Um, they talked to Pharaoh and did just what God asked them to do, is to say, let my people go, okay? Moses gave that message. Moses and Aaron gave that message to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. God wants my, his people to be let go, so that's what you need to do. Well, it didn't happen quickly. And as you see, this, this goes on chapter to chapter that Pharaoh had a hard heart and he did not want to let his people go. They were slaves. They were, his, they were his economy. And he even had tried, if you remember earlier, um, when they enslaved the people. 
it was for economic purposes, but he wanted to even get rid of the boys, all baby Jewish boys. He said, you're going to need to, you need to kill them. And so this was an evil man who was trying to wipe out these people. And we talk about genocide. So, after Moses does this, if you look at the, the, the heading on chapter 5 of Exodus there, sometimes those headings are, are helpful. It's not actually written in the Bible. It's just something that people put there to help us kind of get our place. It says, bricks without straw. One of their jobs was to make bricks, and they needed straw in order to make bricks. And when Moses came and talked to Pharaoh, Moses or Pharaoh rejected that message. So Pharaoh is the king of Egypt, and he says, no way, I don't even know the Lord. Why am I going to listen to what he says? And Egypt was a land that had lots and lots of gods. They were polytheistic, and they were pantheistic. So there was, there was like gods they believed in of, of everything. And you'll find that when the ten plagues come in, they were, uh, from what I have read, they're specifically designed to counter those specific gods or some of the specific gods that the Egyptians worshipped. But here we have Pharaoh saying after this, he made things worse for the people. He said, okay, no, I'm not going to provide straw for you guys anymore. You go get your own straw, but you have to make the same amount of bricks. He was just cruel labor, and it was unfair. And uh, so we go all the way through to chapter 5 about that, and then we get to <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. I can hear some frustration in Moses' voice there, right? He's, things have gotten worse for that. He's trying to do what God wants him to do, and he says, God, it's not working out. Then we'll go into chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, okay, this is right after Moses expresses his frustration with God. He says, the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of his mighty... Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. So when you're in the middle of it, just remember that God hasn't forgotten you. Sometimes we feel like God has forgotten me. Verse 6, Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. <clears throat> and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So when he talks about the Lord, when you see capital L and that little capital O-R-D, it's talking about Yahweh. He's talking about the word Jehovah. Yahweh is the word, it comes from the word that says, I am. God is promising to be with them. I am the Lord. Notice how many times, I don't know if you could count that, how many times God says, I will? So right away in verse 6, I am the Lord. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. 
I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And I will bring you to the land. I will give it to you as a possession. Anybody count that? I think there's like seven I will statements in there. And this is for this time here, but God also says I will to us. And some of those very same things that he will promises to do for them, Jesus has done for us. In Jesus, he says, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Jesus brings us out from the yoke of slavery to sin, the bondage to sin. He says, I will free you from being slaves. Jesus frees us from being slaves to sin and to Satan. I will redeem you. What does Jesus do? He redeems us. He buys us back. He says, I will take you as my own people. So it's not just the forgiveness of sins, but it's to be brought into the relationship with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will take you as my own people. It's not that God ever is a stranger. He says, you are my people. You're my son. You're my daughter. This is what Jesus talks about. When he talks about God being our Father when we are in Him. That special relationship. He says, I will be your God. I will bring you to the land I swore you. God makes His promises. He's, he's promising heaven for us. He's promising us eternal life now and into the future so that when we die, we do have the hope of heaven. On Thursday, Kim had a service Kim and Brett did a service for Kim's uncle who recently passed away. And the, the promise, the hope that was there because of Jesus' promise, that if you believe in me, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. To those who, be, who believed in him, who, to, who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, John 1.12. Oh Lord, thank you for that. Thank you, God, that you came to rescue us and to make us your own, and that in Jesus you accomplished all those things. Amen. So, remember the promises of God. There's so many I wills. Hang on to those promises. So, God told them all of this from the beginning of chapter 6. This is all what God, the Lord, said to Moses. And then verse 9 of chapter 6, we're on page 95, it says, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. So Moses did his part, right? Moses reported this, but the people were just so discouraged that they just said, I don't, I can't even hear that. And that happens to us sometimes. Discouragement shuts our ears off to what God is saying. So we need, to, we need to bring our discouragement to God. So on the one hand, we, we share our frustrations with the Lord. We're open with him, just like Moses modeled for us. But on the other hand, we can't let discouragement close our ears from what God is going to say. So right after that, verse 10 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. Now, this is kind of contagious for Moses because Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? He goes back to his, his old argument with God. I'm not eloquent, God. We don't know what Moses' problem was, whether it was his own self-confidence or whether he had a stuttering problem. We don't know. But either way, he's making an excuse to God. If, if my own people don't listen to me, how is Pharaoh going to listen to me? Look at verse 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He commanded them. So it's a good thing that God doesn't accept our excuses. He understands us. He understands our frustrations. He will listen to us. He's compassionate. But God has a plan, and God wants to do something. And God says... He spoke to Moses and Aaron, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. So it didn't, it didn't matter that they were 
The people were discouraged. It didn't matter that, I mean, it mattered to God. He understood, but it did not stop God's plan. The stuff that happens in your life does not have the power to stop God's plan. You might think that God is off track, that he's messed things up. Like, how could God's plan include this or this or this? But God's plan will prevail. He has a goal in mind. That's why Romans 8.28 is an amazing verse. It's a hard verse. But Romans 8.28 says that God is at work in all things, working for our good. God is at, at work for our good in all things. And he says that in James. He says, rejoice in your trials because God's at work. And uh, I think it's, is it in Colossians as well, there's another passage that says to rejoice, to, to realize that our trials are working for our good, or for our maturity. So God is never done working, and we can count on that. And if we could just rest in that and trust him. Now, there's an interesting section here, and people wonder, well, why is this? Why is this in here? It's, it's a list. It's called a genealogy. It's a list of names of people. So this is written down for us so that we can remember the family tree of Moses. Some of you maybe have done some family research and uh, look at family trees and things. And uh, I was just talking to someone the other day who told me that like after five generations, they chose one couple. After five generations, there were like a thousand people just in five generations, children and children's children and cousins and aunts and uncles and it. It just goes on. To these people who were slaves, these were, these were nobodies, suddenly their family tree was going to matter. It didn't matter to Pharaoh. It didn't matter to the Egyptians. They were just slave labor. But God was going to transform something, and God was making a point. I'm going to read this kind of quickly, but I, I want you to think about why did God put this here? Because So right after this, so right after verse 13, where it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay? Then he goes into this, verse 14. These were the heads of their families. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn son of Israel, were Hanak and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These were the clans of Reuben. It's like, where did this come from? <laughs> so we need to think about that. Why did God put this here? So he starts with, remember that Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and that's where we get the name Israel. And then he had, there were 12 tribes of Israel. They were the 12 sons of Jacob. Okay, so Reuben was the first, verse 15. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jacob, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman, these were the clans of Simeon. Did you get that, Kim? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty impossible. Okay, so we start with Reuben, then Simeon, then he comes down to Levi. So of the 12 sons, he's not going to go through all 12. We're thankful for that. But he comes to Levi. Levi were, was a special group that God set apart for special work when he's going to establish the worship segment. So they were like, Worship leaders, they were special. I mean, they, they carried the tabernacle. They served in the temple hundreds and hundreds of years from this moment. So we're going to focus now on Levi and Moses and Aaron. You're going to find they're a part of this family. They were Levites. So if you're related to Levi, he was your great, great, great grandfather. You, that meant you were a Levite and you were set apart for God's special work. All right, so let's think about that. Verse 16, these were the names of the sons of Levi according to their records. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived 137 years. So if you look through this on your own, you're going to find names repeated. So he's going to, you're going to find the name Kohath and Merari, Gershon here. Um, so he's going to pick those names up and say, okay, this was, 
This name here, Gershon, we're going to say this is these are the people related to him. Kohath, we're going to say these are related to him in another paragraph. And Merari, these guys are related to him. Okay? So verse 17 is that. So he's going to take off on Gershon. The sons of Gershon by clans were Libni and Shimei. Verse 18, the sons of Kohath were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived 133 years. Verse 19, the sons of Merari were Mali and Mushai. These were the clans of Levi according to their records. Amram married his father's sister, sister Jochebed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived 137 years, okay? So note, Moses and Aaron finally come into this picture. Verse 21, the sons of Esar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzapan, and Sithri. In case you need to name your kids, okay, we got some good, li good list here, right? Choosing names. Um, the sons of Korah were Asir, verses 24, Elkanah, and Abisaph. These were the Kohathite clans. Verse 25, Eliezer, son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. Okay, so that segment is finished, all right? He comes back in verse 26 and says this, It was this same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Okay, so make a few observations here. I think I wrote a few of these down. Nope, that's not it. Let me get to sermon number 10. Okay. Sermon number 10. So what we've already kind of covered already, and when he gets to verse 13, he says he commands. God doesn't ask. He tells. <laughs> We need to keep in mind you know, who God is. And, and we don't want to think of God just as just a distant one, but God as a father, a good father, a loving father. Okay, But we also need to remember that God is holy. Remember when he came to Moses, he said, take off your shoes because this ground right here is now holy. Get your shoes off. And he's like down on the ground, like worshiping God. As Dan read earlier in the service, God is holy and he lives an inapproachable light. Okay, so we have to realize God is in charge. When we come to Jesus, we don't just put Jesus in our back pocket and now, we got, now we're on God's good list, right? Like we're on Santa Claus's list or something. No, when you come to Christ, you are saying, God, I'm, you are my boss. You are my master. You are now my Lord. My life is yours. I'm giving it up. Okay, so there's a, not just... Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to accept God's love and his forgiveness, but you're accepting who God is as Lord and master and ruler of this world. But we can trust him because he is good and he is holy and he provides for us to approach him in his holiness through Jesus' holiness that becomes ours simply by faith in him. Okay? Number two on the screen there says, Bible family trees show that it's all connected to real life. So that's one lesson that stood out to me. This is not a myth. This is not a fairy tale. These are like real people. These had real kids, and they really died, and they really lived. So the Bible is full of facts. It's not just something that somebody made up. The Bible is real. And so when we see these genealogies, is what we call them, these lists of kids, kids of kids of kids, that happened with Jesus. You have lists to show that Jesus is not a made-up person. This is history. This is history, and we need to remember that. It's true. But the other point that stands out to me, too, is that roots matter, where we come from. And if you remember way back, maybe you know the movie Roots. Back when I was a kid, it came on, it was on TV, and it was this long series of about how slave people from, America, who were enslaved here, had historic roots that they came from somewhere. They came from Africa. They were taken away from, from their towns, their villages, their cities, their societies, and 
they were transformed into slaves, but they really had dignity and uh, a heritage. So in a sense, we're saying that Moses and Aaron, right here, they're connected to real life, their real history, but their connection as Levites, special servants of God, they're connected here in this way to saying, okay, this is, this is real. And these are who they are, and they are part of this special group, the uh, relatives of Levi. Okay? And the obvious point comes in verse 26 and 27. Regardless of what this means, the, the point is, he's saying, this is the same Moses and Aaron that we're talking about here. So somehow at this particular point in recording these things, um, it was important to communicate that God communicate. This is, this is Moses and Aaron here. And I've been working on them a long time. Remember, Moses was delivered as a baby. He was saved by a little basket in the river. He was about to be killed. But God saved him for a purpose. In that same way, God saves you for a purpose. And I'm just going to close with uh, these last verses of chapter 6. So verse 27, it ends with, it was the same Moses and Aaron. Verse 28, now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Does that sound familiar? It's because he said the same thing on the page before. Why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Two times in the same chapter, Moses is giving his excuse. Notice this, though. Number four on the screen there is God doesn't give up. <laughs> I would have been tempted to just kick Moses to the curb and say, okay, Moses, you are stubborn. You're just giving up on me, dude. I'm going to find somebody else who's willing. And aren't you thankful that God doesn't give up on you and me? He would have kicked us to the curb long ago. But God patiently continues to work with you and me to get us where he wants us to be. That's encouraging. God doesn't give up. And then number five, feelings of inadequacy are very hard to overcome, at least until we're absolutely convinced about the adequacy of God. Our, your inadequacy should be transformed by God's adequacy. Okay? But in other words, feeling like you're not worth it, feeling like you don't have it, feeling like you are not qualified or skilled enough, will be overcome if you understand the greatness of God, that God is able to do it. How many times did he come back to Moses and say, Moses, it's not about you, it's about me. I'm going to be with you. I'm the God who is. I am. I am. And that was supposed to be enough of an answer to help Moses to not focus on his own lack of ability, but to focus on God's ability. And what is that good news? To me, that's really good news because it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about what does God want to do in you and through you. You can't imagine what God can do through you when you simply, like Moses, say, okay, God, here we go. And Moses is about to do that. That's really good news. He's about to not, he's about to give up all of his excuses, all of his reluctance to follow God, and he's ready to say, God, I'm all in. Let's go for it. And he does it. Regardless of the outcome, Moses will stick with it. And that's the point that God is working at with you and me, right? That you will get to the point and say, okay, God, <laughs> I know that I'm not qualified or skilled, but I am your child, and you are the God who is, and who is with me, so here we go. Let's give it a try. God is looking for willing hearts. God is not looking for skilled people. God is looking for willing hearts. That's what's so encouraging about Scott and Laura. They're not going because, hey, we are so wonderful, and we are so able to do this. They're saying, no. God, you're telling us to do this, and we don't know how it's going to happen, but here we are. We're willing. 
That's all God wants from you is, are you willing? And when you are, you will be surprised about what God will do in your life and through you. Okay? Thank you for listening. Let's pray. Lord, we find ourselves very much relating to Moses and his excuses, his discouragement that things were not working out. Lord, I pray that you would speak to your people right now, those who are feeling like, God, this hasn't been working out. I, I gave you my life and things have not been going good. What's the deal? Lord, help them to know that you have not given up on them and that you're not done yet. This is a process and that you're using whatever difficulty that we're facing now as a qualification, as a tool for ministry, as an opportunity to trust you as our Father and to serve you as our holy God. Lord, help us to understand more of who you are so we will be worried less about our failings and inadequacies, to think about who you are. Open our eyes, Lord. Let us be in your word every day so that we can retrain our minds to think your thoughts. So thank you for your patience that helps us along the way to keep learning, to keep reading, to keep trusting, to keep praying, to keep stepping out in faith and being willing to do the things you want us to do. You are amazing, God, and you will do amazing things through your very simple and inadequate people. And I pray for your blessing upon them, O oh God, that their, their gifts, as Paul said to Timothy, would be fanned into flame. It's like a, it's a, like a little spark, but with a little blowing on by the Holy Spirit, that can increase into a flame and then into a, a fire. Blow on us, Holy Spirit, so that we will be equipped for the good work that you have called us to do. You have prepared for in, us in advance good things to do. Show us, Lord, nudge us, remind us of what those things are so that we will follow you and we will experience you. We thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.